All right, let's take our Bibles and look in Nehemiah chapter 2 as we continue our study through this book of Nehemiah. Our text today is taken from verse 1 down to verse 8, and I've entitled this, The King's Heart in God's Hand, over in Proverbs chapter 21. In verse 1, it says, the king's heart. It doesn't specify a good king, bad king. It says, the king's heart, whomever it is, is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of waters, he turneth it whithersoever he will. And we see that illustrated here with regard to Nehemiah, because he was the king's cupbearer which was a very high title. I guess by today's standards, if it was a president, it would be the president's chief of staff. And he's the one that was responsible to make sure the king was protected when it said cupbearer, that nobody <clears throat> slipped any kind of poison into the drink from the kitchen or at the table. All of this he was accountable for the king's well-being. So quite a high title. And yet hearing of the demise of Jerusalem, here's where we see where his true heart lie. It was with the people that the Lord had brought back from captivity and yet he would received news now that the city was still in ruins. The walls, the temple had been rebuilt. But the city remained unprotected. And so I believe here we have Nehemiah as a type of our Lord Jesus Christ who was raised up by God not only for the establishing of the church which the temple represents the body of Christ but the protection of that church represented by the walls that should be built what the scriptures call the walls of salvation there are many enemies all about the church in this world and Nehemiah represents their protector even as Christ represents the head of his church and the church's protector so this is what we see here in this narrative how moved by compassion for the people we see that term used of our Lord Jesus Christ moved with compassion for those who were as sheep without a shepherd. We saw this in Nehemiah chapter 1. Where Nehemiah was praying. And first of all beseeching the Lord. But now moved to action by God for the accomplishing of the work. He would approach this Persian king Artaxerxes. And present to him this petition that the king would give him a leave that he might go and set things in order and here's where we see again the king's heart in God's hand in fact the king himself recognized that it was God's hand that was upon him as verse 8 at the end says the king granted me notice according to the good hand of my God upon me so Nehemiah giving the glory to God for this. But let's read this here in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. It says, And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of our Xerxes, the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad, when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste? 
and the gates thereof are consumed with fire. That goes all the way back to when Babylon had come in and destroyed the city. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I have prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldst send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, for how long shall thy journey be, and when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come unto Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's force, that he may give me timber, to make beams for the gates of the palace which appertain to the house and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. <laughs> you talk about a beautiful story, again, of how God directs all things to his honor and glory and for his purpose. And he does it through means. We know God is sovereign, and yet he has ordained means. Even as we see here, Nehemiah supplicating this king. He didn't just march in there and say, God's sovereign, and I'm going to do whatever I'm going to do, and he's going to direct it. It doesn't matter whether you give me approval or not, O king. No, the Lord's the one who raises up kings and puts them down. He rules over all whether they be supposed good kings or evil. Let's always remember that. You know, kingdoms come and kingdoms go. But God has never abdicated his throne. And so here we find Nehemiah really applying what we find elsewhere in the New Testament in Romans chapter 13. Let's be careful not to be criticizing the powers that be. It's like we complain about the weather. Well, who ordains the weather? We complain about how our day has gone. Well, who ordained the day? And when it comes to the powers that be, look how very specific the scriptures are. Here Paul's writing to the church at a time that was under great subjection by a very evil power, Rome. But guess what? This epistle of Paul was written to the Romans. Not to every Roman, but to the elect in Rome. <laughs> that shows that, just like we read in Jeremiah, even though the Lord brought destruction to that city, he did not completely destroy that remnant or that seed that he had purposed to Save. And here we see in Romans 13, it says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. This was the spirit that was in Nehemiah, acknowledging that that Persian king, Artaxerxes, as ruthless, these were ruthless and barbaric kings, ready to chop a head off at a moment's notice. That's why, you know, when Artaxerxes brought out to him that he was appearing to be sick, he knew that it, unless he could fulfill his duty, this king was very capable of just simply ushering him out and taking off his head and replacing him. That's why he said, then I was sore afraid of the outcome. This is what we're reading here with regard to Nehemiah. But consider even our Lord being subject to the powers that, that were at that time. Herod, Pilate, Caesar, all of these things. And that's why it says here in verse 7, Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, 
Fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. The Pharisees in the day of Christ considered that they did not have to pay taxes to the Roman government. They considered it to be an evil government. And so they came and endeavored to trap our Lord with that statement. And that's where we read where he said, render to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's. And even at one point, because our Lord didn't have a treasure box, he didn't have a house wherewith to lay his head. And when they came and told him it was time to pay the taxes, he sent the disciples to go and catch a fish. And when the fish, they caught him and opened his mouth, there was a coin. He said, now go pay it. That's our Lord. He's sovereign and yet he works through means. And so that's what we see here when it talks about the king's heart and God's hand. It's God using means, even the most wicked of kings, to accomplish his purpose. Now, verses 1 and 2 of my text, when it says he took wine and gave it to the king, the last verse of Nehemiah 1 told us that Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer. Verse 11, you see that? For I was the king's cupbearer. And uh, as I said, that was a significant position in any ancient royal court. The cupbearer was actually the personal bodyguard to the king. You can imagine how great was that task then. He was the one who tasted the wine and the food before the king did and made certain that no one could poison the king. He was a high official in the royal household. And that was his basic duty of choosing and tasting the wine to demonstrate that it was not poison. And of presenting it then to the king. And so that gave him frequent access to the king's presence. And that's why the king knew him. And at this particular time, where he says there in verse 1, Now I had not been aforetime sad in his presence. But here now the king himself noticed the sadness. And so he questioned him. Now here's something too that's easy to overlook when we're studying these scriptures. Because you notice in verse 1 it gives us the specific month. The month of Nisan in a specific year that this took place, the 20th year of our Xerxes the king. You say, well, why would this be so important to put a date in here like this? Well, the date is significant because it gives us, in essence, the date to restore Jerusalem and its walls. And if you go over to Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25, remember we studied this when we were going through the book of Daniel. But now we see the connection between Daniel's prophecy, which was given while the children of Israel were still in captivity in Babylon, and now the follow-up with Nehemiah, well after these Israelites had been brought back into the land. But in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25, it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to what? It, oh, this wasn't the going forth of the commandment to restore the temple. That had already taken place. But here was the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build what? Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So that's 69 prophetic weeks that are described there until the time of Messiah. Well, if you calculate out 69 weeks times seven days in a week and multiply that times 360 days in a year, you get 173,880 days. If you count from this order 
to restore. And that's why this day is important. When it was given here, this would have been around 445 B.C., before Christ. And then you count out the number of days from 445 all the way down to what would be considered here the month of April in Nisan. Actually, April 6, 32. And uh, Christ would have been crucified in 33, somewhere around there. But to the time actually of Christ presenting himself to Israel, which took place at his baptism. That was the public presentation that you would have exactly 173,880 days. You can take the time to go and calculate it. That's an amazing thing when you consider then this was the reason why this specific time of month and year of this King Artaxerxes is put here in Scripture. Again, to show us the fulfillment. And it says there, those are the 69 prophetic weeks, and then the middle of the 70th week, some people are still saying, well, there's been a suspension, and now we're waiting for the 70th week. No, in the, it says after three score and two weeks, in other words, those 69 weeks, shall Messiah be cut off. In the middle of the week, he goes on there in verse 27, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. What's that talking about? That's talking about that time that Christ was ministering there for those three and a half years, and then he was cut off. And then some say that the, the remaining three and a half weeks was the remaining of the time of Israel when Paul went about preaching after Christ had risen and shook the dust off his feet and said because you judge yourselves to Israel unworthy of the kingdom we turn to the Gentiles there was a complete ending then of this prophecy concerning Israel at that time and then we know later on the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD but I just mentioned that to show that everything in scripture is specific and has detail which has significance but coming back here again to my text all this time that he had been serving King Artaxerxes Artaxerxes had never noted him ever to be in a poor demeanor and Again, I see this as a type and picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, he was called a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, but he did not walk around sorrowful in what he came to accomplish. In fact, it says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despised the shame and sat down at the right hand of the Father. But at this particular time, and there are times when you read in our Lord's ministry that he was sorrowful that he sorrowed over even the unbelief when he went to raise Lazarus from the grave it says his spirit groaned within him considering the unbelief of those that mocked him and so we see Nehemiah here in in sorrow of heart as it describes it there in verse 2 seeing thou art I say this is nothing else but sorrow of heart. And in that, you stop and think about why he was sorrowful. He certainly had everything that uh, he could ever want, need, and yet his heart was with this people. I think about our Lord Jesus Christ, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but condescended to come to this earth and take on him the form of a servant and become obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. What Nehemiah was going back to here was a suffering on behalf of his people. And so it was that Nehemiah bore in his heart the care of his people, much like the Lord Jesus Christ does for his own. And so that's where, in verse 3, Nehemiah responds to the king's remark. 
with a way of acknowledging the authority of the king. He said, let the king live forever. This was a common way of showing respect to the kings. And he probably had said these words many times before. But now it had even more significance as he was about to tell the, this wicked king, this foreign king, what it was that was on his heart. And he lays it out. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchers, lack waste and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? I think about our Lord Jesus Christ and considering the lost estate, if you will, of that people that the Father had given him. His whole purpose in his coming to this earth and living out his life was on behalf of this people that it could be described in the same way that the gates were consumed with fire in other words under the condemnation of sin and that it required a mediator that's who Nehemiah is here he represents the mediator who should come and take up the cause of this city and of this people it was evident that they could not do it themselves. Remember I said already 80 years had passed from the time the first decree to go forth and, and rebuild the temple to now. <laughs> and yet the, the gates still lay in waste and the, the, the walls consumed with fire. Were there not capable men there that could see the need themselves and say we're going to we'll rise up and build? Stand in the breach like you hear preachers saying today. Well, it's clear that they didn't. They couldn't. They were living in a devastating situation. But Nehemiah, here's where we see even the heart of the king in the hand of the Lord. It, this is the Lord by his spirit weighing Nehemiah down with a burden for this people. And not just sympathizing their plight, but actually being moved to action. See, that's what love does. It moves to action. When it says there in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. When it says he so loved the world, that word so is the same word used up there in John 3 and verse 14. Even so, Christ would be lifted up. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's the same word, so, for God so, in this manner, loved the world. How did he love the world? This fallen world, this, this world that was consumed and under condemnation, it's he, that he gave. There's the action, just like Nehemiah. Not just sympathizing from afar, but coming now right to where the ruins were and uh, acted on behalf of the people. So this is where we see now him explaining why it was that he was sad. Why it was compared to Christ. Why was he called the man of sorrows, acquainted with grief? To what degree did he go to identify with those sinners that he came to save. Here when Nehemiah was asked, he didn't just say, oh, nothing's wrong. <laughs> just having a bad day or, oh, okay, I I'm okay, I'll be all right. No. He was troubled by this dilemma and took it to heart. I'm thankful that the Lord loves his own more than they care for themselves or else we would be just like Jerusalem here with the city in ruins and not even a, a care as to how to rebuild that city. And so therefore we find Nehemiah pushed by, moved by this compassion for the people asking or requesting of the king that he might go. And that's what we see there in verses 4 through 8 that we read. What did he request? 
Well, Nehemiah knew that unless God gave him favor with this king, he couldn't, he, he couldn't just walk in and ask to be gone for a while. You're the king's right-hand man. It was an appointed position. And so he was much in prayer. That's why he says there in verse 4, Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? He didn't immediately, from what we read here, make his request. What did he do? Just like Daniel in his day. He sought the Lord. What did our Lord do in the face of everything that he came to fulfill? He was constantly seeking the favor of his father. You say, well, he was God already, so why didn't he do that? It's like people would reason, well, this is already predetermined, so why pray? Well, this is the Spirit of God at work, directing him to, first of all, seek the Lord, and then to speak to this king. And even though Nehemiah knew that God would answer the prayer according to his will, this in no way kept him from seeking the Lord and crying unto the Lord for wisdom and for direction even as our Lord himself communed with his Father. And so then we read, I said to the king, this was after having spent this time in prayer. We don't know how much time passed, but we knew, do know that Nehemiah sought the Lord. And that's where he said, if it please the king, and if, the, if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, how would he know that this was the Lord's will and direction for him. Well, it would be in finding favor in his sight. We prayed that way, not knowing which direction to turn, but asking the Lord that if it be his will to make it plain, to make a, a certain direction favorable as we're seeking his face. And that's certainly what Nehemiah is doing here. He's in essence asking this wicked king to share with him this concern for Jerusalem and in essence become a partner to join with him. You know, some would look at this and say, oh, well, he shouldn't have asked for anything from, from this king. He should have just maybe asked to leave but then leave the rest to the Lord. No, all of this the Lord directs even through wicked people that don't know him. When he was asking that he be sent to Jerusalem. That's the word he uses there, that thou would send me unto Judah. He didn't even stand before him and say, look, the Lord's sending me there, and so you need to let me go. No. Again, God's a God of means, and the whole purpose is clearly laid out. He's letting this king know he's not abandoning him because he, he asked for, for, that it be for a time, so it pleased the king to send to me. You see that in verse 6? That's how Lord, the Lord directs. I remember the story one time about, I took, shared it before with you, about the woman that was needy. And this is back in the day when they didn't have air conditioning. And she was praying with her window open and asking the Lord to provide for her daily bread. She was just really down to nothing. And there were some kids playing outside the window that heard her asking, and they were giggling and thought, well, let's go home and get some bread and throw it through the window. And so they did. They ran and got some bread, and they brought it, and they threw it in the window. And all of a sudden, they heard the woman stop praying. And then she started praying again, thanking the Lord for the bread. And that's when the kids just, they were jumping up and down, mocking her, and say, they said, uh, you know, that, that wasn't the Lord brought that to you. That was us. And uh, she said, well, you may have brought it, but the Lord sent it. And I like that answer. Even here, when it says, so it pleased the king to send to me. This was the Lord sending him, but bringing him there through this wicked king. This ought to forever encourage us, even in how we pray and how we address our Lord, first of all, looking at how Christ prayed, that he sought the Lord's will in all things, and that's why we pray, 
Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. And so all of these details were worked out right on down to him giving him some timber that would be used for the building of the house. We don't know how the Lord's going to be pleased to accomplish his work, but I think about how the Lord uses even unconverted people to provide for his church in this world. Think about your employer, where you're employed. Can the Lord bless and prosper an employment for the elect's sake? Absolutely. That income you're earning, that salary you're earning, coming through a secular business, yet the Lord's using it to provide for you one of his children. Let's never forget that. I think about this church building where we meet that was built back in the last century. And was built as a house. I don't even know who the original owner was. I know they didn't build it for a place for the Lord's people to meet as we are now, but guess what? Here we are, right here on this corner. In fact, someone showed me a map of the city where this house was on the map of the city was not even yet built at that point. I forget the date exactly. But here it is. The Lord purposed it. And so God saw it in all things. And even down to the giving of the timber, the writing of the letters, granting the protection. According to, and that's the part I want to end with here, according to the good hand of my God upon me. In the end, anything that's accomplished, we're not going to attribute it to our prayers. We're not going to attribute it to our giving. But attributed to the good hand of my God being upon me. I know there are some that say, well, God's sovereign, why even pray? Well, first of all, we pray because the Lord himself is to be honored. When he says here, so I prayed, who did he pray to? Verse 4, to the God of heaven. That is an old message right there. That's who he is. I've had people say, well, if I believe like you did, I wouldn't pray. Well, if I believe like you did, I wouldn't pray. If somehow it was up to me, and you're just throwing up prayers and hoping God will hear it and answer, that's not. He said, I, I pray to the God of heaven. And secondly, prayer is a way of being humbled before the Lord. Nehemiah didn't fall back on any of his position here to influence the king. He commended it to the Lord. And... Uh, Thirdly, we pray because that's that's the mean, that's the way that God has decreed the means as well as the end. Intermingled in his sovereign decree are the prayers of his people. Because who, who gives the prayer? It's, it's the Lord. He's the one that gives the need and then he gives the cry. And certainly our Lord himself was an example. Though he was God in the flesh, yet he was heard. Says there in Hebrews, in that he feared.